Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the What's in My Head podcast. Today, I've got Rob Renzetti, man, Dexter's Lab, meaning the count. We've got so much shit to talk about. Rob, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. And I, I, I didn't want to throw everything you've really worked on out there just yet because I like to keep it somewhat in some kind of order. This thing is sure. all over the place. That's why it's called What's in My Head because 90% of the time, it's just me shooting from the hip, man. But I've been so fascinated with your work specifically i first started seeing your name pop up on a little show and i'm a redheaded dude and he's on my shirt somewhere in here dexter he's over here so i started seeing oh, yeah. your name pop up at a very very young age rob renzetti rob renzetti rob renzetti why do i keep hearing this name why do you keep seeing this name and when i reached out and started doing this dexter's lab project you were the first person that actually responded the only person that's really responded so far for, for <laughs> the dexter's lab project we're getting at but I mean, you're a get, I mean, I'm not saying you're a white whale right now, Rob, but I didn't think I was going to be talked to Rob out of anybody in the cast. Like I figured I'd get a couple storyboard artists, a couple writers here and there, you know, start at the bottom, work my way up to the top. But I got one of the biggest guys for the Dexter's lab. And not only that, but my life as a teenage robot creator right here in front of me. So Rob, man, I'm I, very yeah. hungry for attention. That's how you got me. <laughs> I mean, if anybody's hungry for attention, it's this guy right here. I mean, I've, I love, I've been, like I said, I've been following your work since I was such a little child. And uh, I, I'm just fascinated with, with, with everything you've really put your name or to, what you lent your name to, too, as well. And uh, I would love to know, man, how did you get your start? Or when did you start looking at animation as a possible profession? Uh, I started looking at it as a possible profession when I was a little kid. Um, I was, there's a couple of weird beginning influences in my life. Um, the first one is my mom, which is, you know, sounds trite. Um, I love my mom. She was a good mom. Um, but the reason she's an influence on me is because um, she actually had a little bit of drawing ability. And when I was super, super young, I would bring her um, images from my coloring book and she would, she would copy them mm -hmm. and cut out the copies for me um, so I could have like paper dolls to play with. And I was just fascinated by this. And I bugged her so much that eventually she said, well, why don't you try drawing them for yourself? Because basically I've had enough of this and I want to get back to all the other stuff I need to do. Um, so that got me started uh, drawing. So I was drawing for very, from a very young age. Um, and the other influence also coming from my family was my cousin, uh, my older cousin. I was, I was in this weird interim generation in my family where really it was just me and one other cousin who were my age um part of the reason was my dad was my mom's second marriage so my brothers I had two brothers they're much older than me from her first marriage um and all my cousins were much older than me and one of those much older cousins was a Disney fanatic didn't draw wasn't an artist but just was in love with Disney and this was back when you could not see Disney cartoons on TV way before the Disney channel way before any of that kind of stuff way before cable um and um but he had all these art of Disney books he actually had the art of all Disney he had the original first publication of that book, which is very, very valuable. Yeah. Um, but I just was into it for the for the pictures. Not only that, but he got any Art of Disney book that came out. So whenever I went over to my cousin's house, uh, or my aunt's house, he was still living there, um, <laughs> I would sneak up to his room and just rifle through the pages of these books and just imagine the cartoons that were in, you know, kind of displayed in those books. So that kind of um, also fed my my interest in animation and my um, and my uh, love of it. And um, I wanted to be in, I wanted to do that for a living so badly. Um, but as I aged up and got to high school and got to a part, point where you start to have to actually thinking about your career, animation was actually dying out. I mean, it was before, it was like the mid, late seventies, I'm really aging myself now, but, um, <laughs> and into the eighties and things were just not good. Um, so when I, be, when I was of college age, I went away to a place called University of Illinois, which is downstate Illinois. I'm from the suburbs of Illinois. And um, I just went there and I thought I would become a graphic, uh, graphic design artist. And then I didn't get into that program. So I was an art history major. And it was only when I was coming to the end of my college career that there was a random article in the Chicago Tribune about Cal Arts out here in California. I'd known I'd known vagely that Walt Disney had, the, the the Walt Disney had started some sort of animation school, which is not the, you know the real full story, but uh, for for shorthand, that's what I knew. And then Cal Arts was just coincidentally there was an article about it in the Chicago Tribune, so I was able to hunt down a, a school catalog. And as I was graduating from this four university, 
I told my poor suffering father that I was going to continue in college and try and go out to this very expensive school out in Los Angeles. And I was hoping he would continue to fund my career. Uh, and uh, with much prodding from my mother, he generously agreed. Um, and so that's kind of how I got interested in animation. Um, and uh, eventually I went out to CalArts because as I was finishing my career, Roger Rabbit came out and then Little Mermaid and um, and um, All Dogs Go to Heaven. And there was kind of the start of the renaissance of animation, luckily coincided with me still being young enough to get into the trade at a time when it looked like the you know future of animation was coming back. It, it, it's funny you bring up those three movies. So those three movies all have a specific, I don't wanna say jumping on point for me, but when I was really, really young um, and I don't remember it. So I was always teased with it. You know, when I was younger, Disney VHSs were everywhere, right? Me and my brother would take them out and we'd build little forts with them. We'd take our little matchbox cars we'd use them for ramps and stuff like that. But going back to Little Mermaid, just for a second, um, I, my, my sister and my mom said I was infatuated with this, with this show or this, mm -hmm. this movie, excuse me. I don't know what it was. I, I want to assume it was just the colors. Cause I noticed that when I, when my son was younger too, a movie came out right around him, him being a year, year and a half old called Rio. I don't know if you've ever seen it or, you know, it's a bird I've movie. One, yeah. You know, so it was it's just very colorful. I can tell from yes. what I've seen beautiful colors right so I think that's what it yeah. was it was just like oh shit I, I'm seeing all these pinks and yellows and purples and blues and reds and stuff like that and just making that association and then you bring up all dogs go to heaven I just my son and I that's our thing we'll sit here and watch movies or when before COVID we'd actually on every Wednesday I'd get out of work early and uh you know I'd go and get him because Wednesdays are generally early release days so we go and get him and then we go to the movie theater we pay matinee prices and we go and see a movie um but we haven't been able to do that since COVID like most people um, right. so everything that we can watch, we watch either on one of the streaming services or I buy from Amazon or, you know, insert whatever to get whatever movie you want here. And he just saw, um, all dogs go to heaven for the first time. And he was like, wow, that was a Disney movie. And I'm like, no, it wasn't. He was like, it looks like a Disney movie. It feels like yeah. a Disney movie. The animation style from frame to frame to frame feels like a Disney movie. Uh, but it wasn't. And then you bring up who framed Roger Rabbit. I had such an infatuation with Jessica Rabbit when I was younger. I don't know what it was. I'm being, Rob, we're being honest. We're red-blooded Americans here. We know exactly what it was. You know, but it was just, it was something about that movie. And that movie struck, like, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. Like, from start to finish, that movie is a instant classic. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've just started, I had Jerry Beck on here not too long ago. Um, I just started, you know, going deeper into you know, American animation and just film animation, all this other crazy stuff. So I'm very novice when it comes to this. I know modern cartoons, I know all of this stuff, you know, but going back and really learning like where this got invented, how this got made, how this went from here to here to here. And you have all these layers and all these different flavors going into one show, one movie, you know, so I'm, I'm like I said, I'm learning that aspect now. But those three movies specifically, it's crazy. It's like, like, like I said, it's crazy you bring up those three because with the infatuation of Little Mermaid, with the infatuation of Jessica Rabbit, they're all redheads for some reason. I don't know, you know what it is. Maybe it's because I'm a redheaded dude. You gotta keep to your kind. Yeah, man, this, well, that's what that's what I'm getting. Rob, I need you to do me a favor. There's mm -hmm. not enough redheads in movies and in TV shows. We only get a couple of us here and there, and we're generally, you know, we're killed off pretty instantly. You got Tormund from Game of Thrones. He lasted a great long time. Um, I can't really think of any. Oh, you had the Weasley twins and the Weasleys from Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. Everybody's mm -hmm. favorite gingers, but. Um, but nonetheless, we're not talking about Harry Potter or Rod, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. We're talking about Rob Renze right here, right now. So going to a redhead and where I first started remembering your name or seeing your name was Dexter's Lab, right? So we're jumping ahead just a little bit, you know, because you were talking about your dad having to, you had to poke and prod him through your mom so you could go back to school, the expensive art school in Cal, Cal Arts. Um, but what was your first job in animation? How'd you get your foot in the door, if you will? Oh, boy. My first job was uh, working for... Um... Uh, a guy in Chicago, mm -hmm. um, and I'm gonna—I can't remember. Actually, can't. I'm spacing on his name right now. But he had a company called Star Tunes. Okay. Um, and he was—he um, was a teacher at the school I went to between University of Illinois and Cal Arts. I went to school in Chicago for one year at a place called Columbia, uh, which was in downtown Chicago. Okay. And um, uh, he was a teacher there, and he gave me a job. Uh, doing in-betweens mm -hmm. um, between um, 
between years of Cal Arts when I came back to Chicago for the summer. Um, so I just did I did in betweens on tiny a couple of Tiny Tunes episodes and a, a Tasmania yeah. uh, uh, episode or two, um, and that was it. That was it. I was just like a couple a couple uh, months in the summer, and um, that was my first real professional job in animation. Do you remember that first feeling when you finally put pencil to paper and you can consider yourself a professional? Did you have- Yeah, it was panic. <laughs> Did it feel- <laughs> I, knew I, couldn't, I knew I couldn't draw as well as John could. <laughs> um, in between is great though. In between is great because, I mean, it's tedious as hell, but um, it's great because you're training your hand to mimic shapes from someone who can make better shapes than you can. Um, and um, actually, he he taught me a great um, a great trick to instantly draw better, which is and this is very simple, but it's not something that I'd ever thought of. Which is, you always you're drawing, you're constantly going to be drawing in arcs, and you you it's really hard to draw a successful arc against the 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 way your wrist moves. So if you're trying to make nice arcs, you always want to make them with your with the way your wrist arcs. And that means that that's that's the main reason why old animations the um, desks have discs because you can just rotate the drawing to any degree you need to to make nice arcs and and to draw with the way your hand naturally moves as opposed to something that's stock still and like you have to have to go against your hand to draw this particular part of the drawing so you're constantly constantly rotating your drawings and and keeping the arc of your hand um, going and your drawing your drawings instantly improved by like doing that. Um, so you know I was drawing, I was mimicking the two drawings that were very good drawings from him and trying to put a good drawing in between. Um, and doing that is a very it's a very good experience. I probably should have done it for about two or three more years than I did um, because I would have gotten be much better draftsman than I am. But you know that was the kind of the start of just the, like that first lesson he gave me. Um, I mean, honestly, I love Cal Arts and I wouldn't, but that was more, that was a more useful basic drawing uh, lesson that I got at two hour, you know, um, two years working at Cal Arts. I mean, like studying in Cal Arts was just that, that idea that you draw, you draw with the arc that your, your hand naturally makes when your wrist rotates. It's, it's funny how when you pick a profession, right, and you go to school for said profession. So like my, this is what I do for fun at nighttime you know, during the weekends, shit like that, because I love talking to you guys. Like I said, when we first started talking, you guys fostered in a golden era, a renaissance, a cartoon renaissance um, back in the early 90s. And even even now into into the 2021s, whatever this decade is considered, um, you, you guys, like I said, ushered in th this amazing amount of just cartoons, animation, some of the best voice actors you know, I've ever heard in my life. Um, and then when you guys sit there and pick a profession, when you pick any profession, when you go to school for said profession, right, you've got the book learning that you can do. But I had this, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a I work in the restaurant industry is what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was going to culinary school, I have this chef, his name was Chef Pam, probably my favorite chef through the entire program. This dude was honest, blunt, and like straight to the point, you know, cut all the fat out, no pun intended. Um, and he would always give us these little like tidbits or these little tips and stuff like that. And he would always end it with, you won't learn this in a book. This is why I'm teaching it to you. You know, sure. it, it's funny hearing you say stuff like that and how you kind of can sit here and make these comparisons to other professions where this guy just said, just turn it. You're going against the arc, right? Same thing in the industry or in, the, in the cooking industry. Hey, hey, just, you know, don't add salt to that right now. You let it reduce a little bit and then you add the salt after because if you add the salt now and it reduces, it's going to be too salty, right? He's like, you can't learn that in a book. So it's cool to see that in different professions, you have these little, these people that are in this profession that go, oh, just, you know, do this, try this, do this. It, it's just cool to see, you know, that type of stuff. Sure. Um, well, let me, yeah, let me, let me stop you. It, okay. John's last name is McClanahan. I had to look it up because I didn't want to mispronounce it. <laughs> It's, 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 I, it's Don McClanahan, his company was StarTunes. I think he sold it from now, but he had that company for a long time and did a lot of work in Chicago, uh, subcontracting for Warner Brothers, doing all those Warner Brothers shows mm -hmm. um, in the early 90s and uh, employed a lot of people in Chicago. So he was, he was, he's a great guy. I haven't talked to him in, in years, but um, yeah, he was, um, he was really, 
it was he was a great person to start uh, off working for. And yeah, he was it just the practical part of doing your job is the most important part. I mean, like like you said, you don't learn this stuff out of a book. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like when you start working that you really learn your profession if you're lucky enough, you know, to get in on and get a job. It, it, it's it's and thank because I was I was actually trying to look it up when you said it I was like I'm like ah oh, it's just saying Warner Brothers yeah yeah he's a he's a he was a great guy and was really um really um nice to me and a number of other animators in um Israel. also employed my friend Gandhi Tartakovsky we were both we both worked as um in betweeners um he hired both of us for that summer when you stop when you stop and think about that just for a sec you and Gandhi both working in the same spot at the same time, right? You obviously went, you know, one way, he went the other way with all your different shows and, and how your career sure. is kind of done. But you guys worked together quite a bit. I mean, from Samurai Jack to Dexter's Lab. Um, I, I can't, yeah. did you work, did you work on Primal at all with him? Um, I did just a little bit of timing on it um, yeah. when I had a, had a moment, okay, um, I mean, but that's it. I mean, but you two guys, and I'm, I'm not sitting here trying to, to blow smoke or anything like that. You guys are fantastic at your job. I mean, Gendy, specific, Gendy as well. Um, and just talking about him for just a sec, because we'll, I was going to bring him up anyways, because I mean, you can't bring up Dexter's Lab without bringing up him. You, can, you can't bring up Samurai Jack. You can't bring up Prime. You can't bring up any of these major hits without bringing up the creator. Um, and to know that not only did he nail it with Dexter, but he went and nailed it again with Samurai Jack. And then he went and nailed it again with Primal. And to think Primal in today's day and age where an attention span is non-existent with the advent of smartphones and TVs and all these different crazy distractions that we have going on a consistent basis, our attention spans went from maybe two minutes down to 30 seconds at most, right? At least that's what I think. And I'm a dumb guy. So, I mean, I just look at people and I can tell they're just staring off into space. They're not listening to anything I'm saying, right? But to know that this man had hit after hit after hit and you yourself had hit after hit after hit is fantastic. And I know you guys start at the same spot under the same person. I mean, do you ever sit well, there? Actually, we started, we started sooner than that, which was um, without going into too much detail. When I was going to University of Illinois. I actually roomed with Gendy's older brother, Alex, for a year. Among, I was, we had five, we were five of us living together. Alex and me were two of those five. Um, and I met Gendy with a bunch of his high school friends when they came down basically to party and get drunk at the University <laughs> of Illinois for one weekend. I didn't really meet him. He just kind of crashed on uh, my floor or his brother's, brother's floor, I guess you would call it. Um, and then we coincidentally met again when I was in school for that year at Columbia in Chicago. Um, the reason I went there was because I applied to CalArts, didn't get in the first time. And then... Um, heard that Gendy was going and studying animation in Chicago at this place called Columbia. And I applied and I, I got into Columbia and we coincidentally just signed up for the same figure drawing class, uh, recognized each other across the room and became fast friends after that and basically became inseparable that year in Columbia and um, actually cajoled him into uh, applying to CalArts again with me. And then we both got in and drove out to California together in my 1974 Dodge Dart. And uh, were roommates at CalArts for two years. So we were, we were, we were friends, we were roommates, and then we became co-workers together at Hanna Barbera on Two Stupid Dogs. We both got hired together on Two Stupid Dogs along with our friend Craig McCracken, who became art director. And then we were all there in place and uh, doing shorts when you know Dexter got picked up. Um, so he kind of had the core people of his crew <laughs> already around him because we'd all been making shorts at the same time and making them together and the shorts that he made with uh, Paul and Craig for Dexter the two shorts were kind of like those were the two pilots for the show yeah um, and uh, you know I was doing I had done a I'd done a my my first pilot for me and account at the same time yes. and then when Dexter got picked up we all just became the you know the core crew of, of, of the show uh, for Gendy it's insane i mean we glossed over craig because there was so much content right there just talking about I mean, craig, ladies and gentlemen power <laughs> um i mean craig gets plenty of attention we're talking about me <laughs> sorry well, i wipe my glasses oh, no you can't worries. see the dust you can't see the dust but i can i can see it no worries man uh but it, it's just it's just crazy when you think about you three specifically you three working on just dexter right i mean you guys split apart and you have all of these shows. I mean, they could have built a stable around just you three. And then you bring in John Dilworth for Courage and you bring in Danny mm -hmm. Antonucci for Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Then you bring in Van Partable for Johnny Bravo. I mean, you have 
creator after, and then you had Seth MacFarlane and uh, David Feist on Cow and Chicken. And then you have Seth MacFarlane working on Cow and Chicken. I mean, if you just took a snapshot of your name and everybody else that you guys specifically worked with just in the early nineties, just took a snapshot and you would go and throw a dart. And I guarantee you hit every creator on every show that's on TV right now when it comes to animation. It is wild to think what Fred Cyber, like he had this foresight. He's like, we're just gonna do a whole bunch of animation. We're gonna put these things out there. We're gonna do what a cartoon, cartoon, cartoon. And we're gonna throw, I can't remember what it was. When I had Fred on here, he told me, I, for some reason, my brain's just not clicking right now. I don't know what those numbers are either. So. Yeah, it's like 105 or something like that. You know, it's just something a lot. crazy. Yeah, it was a lot of just, you know, pilots in here and there. Uh, but it's just wild to know that you three specifically all work on the same show and then you guys branch off and you have your own shows. Um, but going to Two Stupid Dogs, because Donovan Cook isn't brought up enough either. Um, what was that like working on that show? I mean, do you have fond memories of it? Oh, very fond. I mean, it was all the same people. We, um, um, you know, Donovan was a great boss. He gave us a lot of artistic freedom. It was a storyboard driven show which meant that we got an outline we got like a page or two yeah. describing the story but um there was a lot of um you know you had to come up with the visuals you had to come up with the the dialogue you had to come up with the jokes you had to do kind of all the work that goes into a cartoon and it was a great training ground for all of us um, before Dexter got picked up and before we did all our own pilots to work on that show see what see what worked see what didn't work um and uh you know kind of get you know use it as a uh, kind of a set of training wheels for us um it, un unfortunately it wasn't successful uh, super successful it was kind of you know kind of put gave a horrible time slot and it didn't do very well but um um especially for me because uh Gendy and Craig only worked on first season but I I came back and worked on the second season of that show before I did the show for Mina um in the second season I had a great learning experience because what Donovan would let me do is I would um I come up with an idea for a short then I storyboarded it, and then I and then I directed my own storyboard. So that was those were my first um, efforts at directing. And what directing kind of means in that context is basically um, timing out the show, you know. And um, we at first we didn't really we didn't really do um, animatics for that show. We so kind of just had to kind of figure out the timing um, in my head using the little bit of animation experience I had from animating my student films send it overseas, see it come back, see how like, oh, that was, that, that, I, I timed that too slow. That could have been twice as fast. Yeah. And editing it and, and tightening up the timing and kind of learning about timing um, from doing, doing like doing a storyboard and knowing how I wanted it to feel, mm -hmm. doing the timing, sending it overseas, seeing where I hit the mark, where I missed it. Um, that was a great learning experience. So I, on the second season, I think I only storyboarded three or four episodes but I, I think it was just three but I got to direct all three of those and actually actually animated a couple of cycles and did a few things in there here that sent them overseas so it was a there was a lot of artistic freedom that Donovan gave us and a lot of um, experimentation with the characters and um, and um, you know and uh, just exploring a lot we also had weird the weird the weirdest part of that show was the middle cartoon which was um, Super Secret Secret Squirrel, which was just a, a like a revival of a cartoon that we had all loved as our, as children. Mm -hmm. um, I loved Secret Squirrel. I used to see it on the Banana Split show, uh, the version of the Banana Split show that they showed in reruns in Chicago. And it was one of my favorite of the cartoons. Um, um, and so we just were trying to pay homage to that and, and make it as good as we remembered. What we didn't realize is we, not to be, sound brag, braggish, but we made it better than we remembered because <laughs> we really, Paul Rudish was the art director on that part of the show and he did a fantastic job. And we just, there was a lot to work with in the terms of those characters because it was kind of first, the kind of first superhero thing any of us kind of worked on. He wasn't legitimately a superhero, but had the the staples of that genre, you know, villain, a villain every week and a, some kind of mystery or, or yeah. villainous plot to unravel. Um, and uh, there was just a lot of, um, uh, it was easy. It was kind of easier to find stories with that than it was with Two Stupid Dogs, which was kind of a little bit more amorphous. It's about, you know, it's kind of a, when you have those kind of more wide open comedies, it just kind of falls to the the particulars of that episode. But it's kind of you don't have as much to hang your hat on and kind of zero in on, mm -hmm. um, you know, similar to what we encountered with Dexter and with uh, Dial M for Monkey, the middle cartoon there. Dexter. Dexter had definitely more solid, there was more stuff to hang on to right there, but like still it was like, it was a comedy duo. It was kind of Dexter versus Dee Dee. And there's an, 
there's no necessary story there. Usually, you know, Dexter would invent something, Dee Dee would come along and mess with it, but it didn't always come in. We didn't always enter from that angle on things, even from the first, you know, from the first episodes. But Dial in for Monkey, you knew like he's a superhero. He's going to go up some against some kind of villain. He's going to defeat that villain. It, you know, in seven minutes, that's basically what's going to happen. But there's there's a there's a form there, and there's a genre that you can kind of um, sink your teeth into, and then you just kind of play with the details of that genre. Sorry, I kind of went woo and rambled off there, no, but regardless, I, there you go. No pun intended, because like I said, I work in the, the 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 food industry. I love seeing how the sausage is made. Essentially, I love seeing the behind the scenes things, because like I said, I'm very new to learning a lot of the lingo, a lot of the terminology, and a lot of the things that you guys do. I mean, I just look at stuff. And I'm like wow, this is pretty. This has substance. These voice actors are really, really good. This is really well written. And then when I start talking to you guys, especially animators, and I love talking to artists specifically, I like talking to writers and voice actors as well. But artists, I feel like I can connect with them on a specific level because in my field, I'm very artistic, right? Food is an artistic art. It's, it's an art form, right? Mm -hmm. um, you make things that are very ugly look very, very pretty. And then people- Well, you do. I don't. I'm lucky if it tastes good. <laughs> I've had to do a lot of home cooking in the last year that I didn't have to otherwise do. <laughs> we used to go to a lot of restaurants pre-COVID and uh, we really haven't been doing that. So like I had to get a little better at cooking and I, but I appreciate when you can make something that tastes good and does look good. It is, it is an art form. Well, I think we just have a new show right now, Rob. It's Cooking with Rob and Julian. And then <laughs> no, that is not a new show. <laughs> I teach Rob some easy stuff. I have my own, I have my own little Facebook cooking thing that I started during COVID. Oh, okay. When COVID well, send, send me that, please. No problem. Can use all the help I can get. <laughs> when COVID kicked off, man, they told us all to go home and we didn't know when we were coming back. And there's nothing being there's nothing worse than being an artistic guy. Having something to say and nobody to fucking say it to, right? You just sure. I have all this food that I want to cook, but nobody really feed it to. I mean, my wife and son, and you know, they'll eat it nonetheless. They tell me it's all good, but sometimes you need that one person that's out in that restaurant to tell you, man, this sucks, right? Or why does it suck? How does it better? How do I get better? How do I do this better? How do I cook this better? To innovate, right? To grow. To, to progress in your profession, right? But nonetheless, man, I digress. So we're going to work on that show, Rob. Rob and Julian cook in the world. Something along those lines. <laughs> sure. But uh, there, there was something you, you brought up earlier when, 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 you, when you started explaining everything from directing and timing and all this other stuff that I really wanted to hit on because I have not had the chance to ask this from an animator that has done both animating, writing, and directing, and then doing a whole bunch of other stuff as far as producing and stuff. At, at as, as far as your entire profession goes, is there one specific, um, I don't, how do I break it down? So as far as artists writing, producing and directing, is there one specific genre, I guess, in animation that you get more gratification from? Do you feel better when you're directing the entire thing? Do you feel better when you're writing it? What do you get gratification for more? I guess? Well, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I probably, if I didn't narrow it down to one job, I probably would pick writing because I feel like I am on a level there with my, can, the people I work with. I'm a good writer. Um, I'm an okay artist, but I mean, I, I went to school with Craig McCracken and Paul Rudish and, and Gandhi. And, um, you know, these people, I all consider them to be better drafts and just on a purely technical and better designers than me. I do okay, but I don't, you know, I don't draw that much for a living uh, anymore because since I've, you know, when I got my own show, I did a lot of drawing during a teenage robot, but I had Alex Kerwin as my art director and he, he drew all the characters much better than me. <laughs> you know, we developed the characters together and we designed them together, but the real, the designs are really his at the end of the day. And I'm glad for it because when you, when, if you're lucky enough to get your own show, you should hire everybody in all the positions that you need to fill. You should hire someone that's better than you at all of these positions. Um, because what you're going to be end, do, end up doing is just supervising them and giving them notes. And you need to have knowledge of everything, but you can't, you, if you try and step in and do all that for yourself, you're going to have to, you're going to step in, have to step in and fix some stuff yourself, but you've got to have reliable people in your, in, in all the areas you can get them so that you're not, um, doing everything, <laughs> fixing everything. Um, on my show, I would, again, my show was, um, storyboard driven mm -hmm. and, um, I, several great storyboard artists that worked with me, but sometimes the storyboard artists would would um, would fall short of what I wanted. And because I was a storyboarder, I knew I could go in and fix it. Mm -hmm. I did not consider myself an art, an, an, a character designer on a level where those character designs can appear on screen. I had Alex for that and um, our other designer, Jill Freimark. 
a free mark. Um, so if something wasn't up to snuff, it was up to them to fix it. That's a great relief when you're creating yeah. your own show, when you know you can't fix it yourself. Because if you know you can fix it yourself, you're probably going to fix it yourself <laughs> because you're struggling to get the best version of your show on air and nobody knows it as well as you do. So when there was a storyboard that wasn't up to stuff or a story that wasn't up to stuff or the timing wasn't quite right, I knew that I was going to be the one that would have to fix that stuff because I knew I could fix that stuff. So um, as far as if I had to choose something that I enjoyed the most, it's probably writing because writing is probably the simplest thing. It's the conceptual part of it, which is the most important part to get the story and the characters right. But the execution you can leave to others that are better at that execution than you are. Um, on Kid Cosmic, the show I'm, I'm working on now with Craig, I'm the co-EP on that. Mm -hmm. um, I've written a lot of the episodes. Story edit, we're both story editors though, which means you fix the writing when it's not quite what you want. Yeah. So I've touched almost every episode of Kid Cosmic I've touched the writing of almost every, every episode. Now, after that, we go, we both weigh in on the animatic and the animation and, and the, board, the storyboarding. We, we have our notes on all that stuff as well, along with our directors. Um, but I'm not responsible for fixing any of that stuff. Yeah. My job doesn't call for me to fix any of that stuff. It just calls for me to critique that stuff. So that's simpler for me. And also uh, the writing is something that I really enjoy. I like, uh, since I have my own show, I've never I've never had another show of my own, but I've been involved on a very high creative level with several projects where I help come up with the characters, help come up with the stories, help create the basis of the show. And I enjoy that work very much. Um, I enjoy being one of the creative leads on a show, if not the creative lead, which you are when it is your show. Yeah. So, you know, being second in command or third in command, so much easier than having your own show. <laughs> uh, it's a whole different ball game. Um, and I didn't know that before I had my own show. When I was like second in command on Dexter or second and second or third in command on Dexter, depending upon what when we where we were in Dexter, I could look at Gendy and go like, hmm, he's not doing that quite right. I know I would do a better job on his my show. I don't know why he's wasting so much time on that. Working so late, Gendy. Why? Why why didn't you get it right the first time? I was very, I didn't say any of this stuff to him. Uh, but you know, I was in my very in my mind. It was very smug about how when I had my own show, I do it. I do it much more efficiently, much better. And when I had my own show, it was a train wreck. I was at the office all hours of night fixing stuff, because when you have your own show and you're trying to prove yourself, the work will expand to fill the number of hours that you give to it. You know what I mean? So, I did a lot of work. I worked a lot of weekends. I worked for a very long time every day, uh, trying to get the show as good as it could be before it went on the air. Um, because it's never going to live up to what you have in your head. And uh, I've rambled again now so so much that I don't remember what the really you asked me in the beginning, but hopefully I answered it. Oh, so. oh no, no, it was just asking you what, what you found more gratifying, whether it was writing. Directly. The short answer is the writing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like Rob. I guess I could have just said that, but. No, no, man. I, like I said, I, I love, like I said, I can have you guys on as many times as you guys want to come on. And there's no way that I can do in just one short hour an entire career of Rob you know, what, what's it been almost 32 years? Is that 30, oh, 30 Lord. longer? Yes. No, that, I'm just looking at the number and thinking how big it is. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, I got my, I went to Cal Arts in 1990 and I was working in 92. So it's almost been 30 years. So let me uh, just being a professional, but it's been more than 30 years since I've been pursuing it. So I was born in 89. So my entire life, you don't need to tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> you've been, you don't you've tell been me how much younger you are than me that doesn't give me any joy oh it should man because you've been giving me joy i'm trying to give you some joy. <laughs> okay it's, all right but, but i uh, understand that other people will have to be born after i was i understand that basic concept i don't enjoy it but i understand it <laughs> there's one thing i wanted to touch back on but right before we uh you know go to because we're we're almost towards the end here we got about 20 minutes or so oh no oh god uh, no. all right <laughs> Uh, well, if you're having fun, man, I'd love to have you come back on. Because, like I said, sure. there's just no way we could talk everything and and have everybody, you right. know, as far as everybody being the fans. So you ask me your top questions. I'll try and not talk as long. In the <laughs> no worries. But uh, um, what was it like working on somebody's show and then working on your show? And what I mean by that specifically is, were you more stressed working on somebody else's baby? than your own did you have this feeling like shit i don't want to let my friends down i, I want to do the best that i can for them or was it kind of similar i mean i think here uh, at first yes because uh when dexter was the first not the first show i worked on two stupid dog, dogs was one thing but dexter was the show of one of my best friends um and i wanted it to be good and i wanted to be worthy of it 
Mm -hmm. And I had the two pilots that I talked about, Craig uh, Gendy and Paul, um, all worked on those together. I didn't. I I I I, I saw them working, and I and I um I contributed, but no in no no substantial way. I didn't do any drawing or whatever. I came up with a couple of jokes. I think I tried to animate a scene or two. I don't know if Gendy even ended up using my animation. But they did those pilot. They did those uh, shows. Those two pilots on their own without me. But then when it got picked up, I was a I was a director and storyboard artist. So. I was like, okay, these guys have established this show and now I'm kind of coming in later than they have. So I was very nervous at first about like, well, am I gonna get the vibe and all that? And, um, you know, luckily right away, I started contributing things that became part of the characters because you know, the characters still had a lot of work to do. We still had a lot of work to do figuring out who the characters were and to make them well-rounded enough to support the number of episodes that we ended up doing with them. So at first, yes, I was very stressed about working on Gandhi show because I wanted it to be good. But as soon as I started doing my first and second storyboards and they liked them and thought they were funny. Um, um, I felt at home there. So uh, the stress level was just the work level, which was there was a lot of work to do and we didn't didn't ha didn't have enough time. That ended up being that's always the case, right? Yeah. Um, the stress level on my own show was a lot higher generally once I got into one thing for one thing because I didn't do with those guys. I didn't do it at Cartoon Network where I thought I would have a show. Mm -hmm. um, I thought me and Count would be hopefully become a show there, but that didn't happen. The reason I left was that Fred wanted to do more meaning and accounts at Nickelodeon. I thought it would be my show at Nickelodeon, but it didn't end up happen there again. Ended up being Teenage Robot, but I didn't have Gendy or Paul or Craig to work on it with me. So, you know, I had to find new collaborators. Alex was one of them. I uh, eventually got some storyboard artists that were really strong, but it was just kind of me hanging out there on a story level, kind of trying to come up with it on my own. And that was stressful. Yeah. Um, and I feel like the show would have been better if I'd had my core people working on it with me and being able to bounce ideas and see what they would bring to it. Um, I kind of had to get the show up on its feet on its own and uh, for other people to see it and go, oh yeah, okay, I get it. And then start contributing to it and, 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 and growing it and, and, and become um, collaborators in a way that the, those guys were collaborators with me when we all started together. Um, so generally speaking, my own show was the most stressful thing I've ever done. Um, and I've never done anything as stressful since, because like I said, when it's not your own show, the stress level is generally much, much lower. I, I can see the creator stressing besides me and try and help them through that. Um, but I only take on a little bit of that burden myself. I can never, because it's gonna be, you know, because most people associate these shows, the general public associate the shows with the people that created them. Though every show is a collaborative effort and there's always, you know, a good chunk of people that are creatively uh, contributing to that show in a major way. The public knows the person who created the show. So it's really all on their shoulders. And that that's one thing, I'm glad you brought that up because that's one thing that I specifically set out to do with this podcast in particular. Because like I said, I kept seeing your name on all of these credits and stuff whenever I'd watch Dexter's Lab. And I, I, I don't want to keep forgetting to bring this up. I love Mina and the Count. That was one of my favorite, when I saw that first short, I was like, holy shit, I'm getting Halloween every single day. That's what I'm getting right now because it's my favorite <laughs> holiday. Being a chunky little kid, I'm going, you know, door to door asking, Frankenstein's my favorite monster, just going around asking for candy and stuff like that, right? Or Frankenstein's monster is my favorite monster. Um, and I, I loved just how, I loved the colors specifically when Thank he, you. when he jumped out of the window, trying to go to the sorority house and all that other stuff, it was blue background, you know, that white screen and then the moon and everything. It was just so beautiful. It was so different. Right. And I, I remember, I remember looking at it as a little kid knowing, man, this is a lot different than the other cartoons that I was watching at that right. time. It was like this felt different. I don't know if it was just because it was monsters or if it was you know something along those lines it was because i was incredibly original <laughs> yeah, no it was because i was looking point. back i was looking back at upa um and that around that that was a huge influence on us um but uh you know there was, it was the influence on craig and in, in, in the design of dexter and influence on on gendy especially the way uh the kind of stylized animation that upa had so it was a huge influence on all of us but i i really looked at those things in terms of how they did color and that is one thing I did on the original uh, meaning account was the color script for that short. Um, looking at in the U UPA and in being influenced by that, um, I kind of came up with the colors for the whole first pilot. Um, and, um, you know, so that was something I was trying to make it, I was very, very, very heavily influenced by them. And I was trying, 
try and do something that would be um, worthy of those old cartoons. So thank you for those compliments. Yeah, that, I mean, it was my, um, my first born. I thought it would be my show. Um, that's a whole nother podcast, all the ups and downs that that went through because it became almost became a, a middle cartoon for Dexter. Then it almost became a Saturday morning cartoon at Disney. Then it almost became a show at Nickelodeon where I did five more pilots with it. And then it didn't become a show, <laughs> but because it didn't become a show, that's why I did um, uh, the pilot for Teenage Robot. The pilot I did for Teenage Robot, that slot was originally supposed to be the sixth episode of Mean and Account for Nickelodeon. But they were so freaked out by the idea of a vampire and a little girl being best friends that they didn't want any more after I'd done five. So they canceled the last one. And Fred Seibert said, well, Rob's still going to get that slot. Let's see what else he can come up with. And that's when I invented Teenage Robot. So um, Mina had to die so that uh, Jenny could live, unfortunately. Well, I mean, I, I'm not as well versed in Teenage Robot as I'd love to be. It's one of those ones that I watched, but I only watched the entire series when it was on one time. And with the advent of Paramount Plus, if only everybody had watched it one time, <laughs> then I would have been in better shape. <laughs> I, I I love how cynical you look at things, man. I, I like I like. The <laughs> that oh, you kid. know what? You know whatever. Like, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. If I'm I'm not bitter in any single way. Oh, I am oh, cynical no. for sure. But no, no. Like, look. You know, the reason I love that show it was very stressful. Um, when they said they weren't picking me up for a fourth season, I was. I was crushed. I was crushed. Um, but then I was very happy because it meant that work was going to come to them because it had swallowed my whole life. It was, you know, I was luckily I was married to my wife because otherwise, if she was my girlfriend, she probably would have left me. But she did not see me. She did not see me on weekends for a good two years. I literally worked seven days a week, you know, uh, not around Christmas, but that was about it. I worked seven days a week for a couple of years trying to get that thing up on its feet. And when we kind of had the crew humming along and I felt like, well, we're getting, we're starting to get somewhere. I got good board artists. I got everybody in place. The, the ratings were good enough and they canceled us. So, you know, I don't think I would have wanted to do it for SpongeBob amount of time. Uh, I wanted to do a fourth season and then I wanted to be done, but we got three, se three seasons instead. And, it, you know, it still has a lot of fans and I'm, I'm happy that people seem to appreciate it. But um, yeah, you know, uh, I wish, I wish it had been better rated at the time. The ratings are what sunk it. So. Well, one thing I want to have right before we pass on to this one, man, wives in particular, man, I've been married this year in 10, 13 days, excuse me, because it's May 10th right now. In 13 days, 12 years, I've been married. Um, Congratulations. And, thank you. Um, one thing that, that I love about being married, because the only time I was in Chicago was when I went to Navy boot camp up in Great Lakes in February. I'm from Florida. It is the. <laughs> oh, no the coldest and they always take the southerners and make them do snow patrol as soon as you oh, go sure. to boot camp why wouldn't they <laughs> yes. why would they torture it's bullshit that? rob i see what you guys are doing you guys are trying to break <laughs> us um however i never i never got to do snow patrol because the day we graduated was my shift for snow patrol but i was graduating so i didn't have to get out there and shovel snow at five o'clock in the morning it dumped about 18 inches on us overnight oh no um, but, but going back to a point you made, and I think this is not just for wives, but as spouses in general, man, my wife stuck through hard times. When we did the math, you know, a couple months ago, four years collectively from my seven years and four months or whatever it was inside the Navy collectively, um, I was away from my wife and my son, not in the same house, not in the same country, not in the same state. Wow, that's horrible. So, that's, I mean, that's rough. It, it is, but but you hit on a point that I don't think is mentioned enough in any kind of profession. Really, is your rock, your your you know your your person that you go to at the end of the night, whether whether it's one o'clock in the morning because you're getting off work because you've been drawn and writing all night, or you're getting off the boat because you guys just did a nine month deployment. You know, whatever it is that keeps you away from your family, it is so wonderful. It's so refreshing. It's so invigorating to come home to somebody that loves you unconditionally, no matter what. Right. And you can bounce that stress. You can bounce those ideas. And then you have this way of just letting it all melt away. Right. So I, I just wanted to hit on that one point. Thank your wife when you get off of here, man, because I'm going to thank her because we're still getting great shows from you. Um, thank you. Well, I mean, you know, I don't I haven't had my own show in a long time and my other jobs are less stressful. Some of them I have to work long hours, but usually not seven days a week for two years. So it's been, you know, I conditioned her to think of anything less than that as, as a vacation. But, um, you know, <laughs> another person I should thank is my first pet rabbit, Angel. Yeah, who we got uh, we got this summer. Of, I'm trying to think. 
I think we got it right before I get my show got picked up and coming home and petting a petting any kind of pet, uh, yeah. but especially a very soft rabbit. It was very stress relieving activity. So I was lucky to have a, a have a pet to come home to because I hadn't had a pet since I was a kid. And uh, uh, Tracy decided found her at some um, pet fair and was like, uh, I want to get a pet. And I'm like, I want to get a pet rabbit. I'm like, I'm doing my show. You're going to be responsible for this thing. You're going to feed there. You're going to do everything for her. She's like, that's fine. Um, and uh, she brought her home. And uh, that was, a, it was a very, besides my wife, that was probably the most important creature in my life in terms of stress reduction while I was doing my show. It is insane what an animal can do for you. I got a husky and this is the last story I'll tell you. And then we'll get to one more topic and then we're done for the day. Um, right. But I got the, I've always wanted a Husky. They've been my favorite dog since I saw Balto years ago. I always wanted a Husky. They're so beautiful. Yeah, yeah, they're fun dogs. They're majestic as hell, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember I was like, if I make it out of the Navy, I'm buying myself a dog. Because I had a dog. I had a pit. I have a pit mix. He's old as hell now. Um, he mm -hmm. was a rescue. And, uh, you know, I'd always wanted a Husky, though, right? So I get out of the Navy and I go home or I, I'm driving home. And I, I was stationed in Virginia, right? I'm moving down to Florida where I live. And so we're driving and stuff. And then they have a breeder in North Carolina. So I go and pick up this dog and I could fit her in my hands like this, right? She's like six or seven weeks old. And it's just me driving. It's like 13 hours from when I picked her up to home, sat in my lap the entire way, right? The first three days, because all, we were waiting on all of our stuff to get here from the movers and stuff. So we were sleeping on our air mattress and our house and stuff like that. The, I, I was trying to like break her like crate trainer and stuff like that. So she would get used to, you know, peeing outside, you go up, you have your own little room and all that stuff because mm -hmm. I just didn't, Huskies are notorious for tearing shit up, right? You leave them alone, they get bored, they tear shit up. I've oh, had no. one before, she tore everything up. So we got to make sure they're crate trained and they have their own little room that we built down, you know, downstairs and everything. And uh, so I got her and like the first week, I want to say she would not sleep in her crate. She's a very, very... I pampered the shit out of her. I babied the hell out of this dog, mm -hmm. but I would wear her like a scarf at nighttime because she would wind her <laughs> crate, right? And I would take her out, and she'd be, you know, she'd be all happy and then just wrap her around my neck and then she'd be good, right? So, but there's something to say about a long, hard day where you come home and you can talk to your wife, but there's something different when you can come home and you can pet an animal and they look at you, they're like, they look at you more than just, man, you feed me, you walk me, you play with me. It, it's it's a weird kind of connection, especially with the mm -hmm. dog, any kind of animal that you can really just yeah. you know, like melt that stress away. And I, I like that that you brought that up, man. I think that's something that's overlooked quite often. I mean, uh, I think uh, without getting too philosophical, philosophical, I think there's um, I because I'd missed this since I was a kid. And I don't think I had it the, uh, really the same way when I was a kid. But there's um, connecting to a different creature than another human just expands what you how you feel about the world, how you feel yeah. about existence mm -hmm. because there's something here that's obviously got a mind behind it but it's a different mind than yours it's not the same kind of mind um and it just i don't know there's some you connect with it on a different level than you do another human because you're not communicating verbally you're communicating in a different way i it's hard i mean they can be real pains in the asses when they're yeah. you know chewing shit up or uh peeing where they're not supposed to pee but you know usually the good outweighs the bad far above and i it'd be hard to think of not having a pet um, yeah, again, it, it, have, after having had had uh, uh, our first rabbit who lived with us for 11 years, and now we have a boy rabbit who's been with us for seven. Yeah. Uh, so it's been close to 20 years that we've had pet rabbits. And, and the reason we got rabbits is because my wife had one as a kid. Yeah. And so she wanted, I never had a rabbit. I had cats as a kid. So she, she introduced me to rabbits, but they're, they're pretty good pets. So I, I recommend them. I've got a, I've got four dogs and a cat. Um, so I'm trying wow. to get, I'm trying to get two. On, I think I'm one pet. I don't know. I don't know if we can go above one, one rabbit, maybe two I, at some point. I'm not sure. It, it's something about just getting on the floor and then playing with all four of them at once. Oh, sure. Getting it's covered just, in animals. That, that yeah, can't be too bad. Yeah, man, it can't. You can never, you can never be frowning with dogs around you. I mean, I, I, really, I, can't <laughs> I love frown. dogs. I love dogs, but I like, I like other people taking, having to walk them and poop them. I'd rather <laughs> just pet, pet them on the street and then yeah. leave. leave and go on about living your life all right so yeah. as we wind down the one question that i really really wanted to ask if you had a choice and this is a two-part question because i always end the conversation right. with this one all right if you could sit down and you could sit there and throw the dice and on that set of dice right was two options one option was meeting the count and the other option was life of teenage robot those two shows after you rolled that dice one of those two shows would go away forever right and one of them would be picked back up 
for an entire series, like entire run, right? Which one would you hope would get picked up? I mean, knowing that Teenage Robot has all the fans in the world, I'd have to pick Teenage Robot and 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 do more with that um, because that was that did end up being my show, and I do love it. Uh, it's hard for me to know that there's only those six episodes of Meaning and Count because I really did want it to be a series for such a long time, but. Yeah. Um, you know, it would have to, it would probably have to be Teenage Robot, not just be, because of me, but because I know there's so many people out there who loved it and want, want to see more of it. Um, so I'd probably pick Teenage Robot, but it would be hard to, uh, it would hard, hard to be, say goodbye to me in the account. Do you, do you own me in the account or is that still owned by one? I mean, technically I do. Um, it did come, it did come back to me eventually, but, um, you know, I'm not, I'm, I, there's nobody clamoring for me to do <laughs> more with that show, you know, 30 years later. I mean, sure, there's fans out there, but, you know, I don't know. It's hard, you know, it's hard because I feel like I'm doing that now or doing Teenage Robot again. Like if somebody offered me the chance to do, do those, I probably would take it. But, you know, I'm, I'm not the same person I was back then. And it'd be, I'm not saying I couldn't do more episodes of either. Of course I could, but they would be different. You know, they'd be different. And then, I, as much as I appreciate people's nostalgia for what the shows of their childhood and 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 them wanting to see more, um, it's a double-edged sword when you're a creator of one of those things because you've moved on, because the world has moved on, mm -hmm. and it's hard to live up to people's expectations of what they have in their mind of the thing that comes back. I've seen so many revivals come back and be disappointing to the fans and not live up to their expectation or take things in a different direction. It's, you know, it's hard. It's hard to, it's hard to, uh, it's a it's a hard needle to thread, I guess I would say, and there's very few people that seem to do it successfully. Um, I mean, you know, that, that's a fantastic perspective to look at, man. Because at the end of the day, as us fans, we want more of whatever you guys are creating. Because we absolutely. I mean, I'm the same. I'm fan. I'm yeah. you know, I'm I'm fans of things. I wish they went on forever. Um, yeah. Uh, there's stuff that exists that, of course, I want more of. You know what I mean? Yeah. But at the same time, I like when things come to an end and they reach an end, and I'm. I love Batman, but I don't know that we need another Batman movie for maybe the next 10 years. You know what I mean? Like, hold on, uh, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> I know I'm very, very much in the minority on that. People <laughs> love that. The people will take a new Batman movie every, every, but I'm looking at it from a creative perspective. Yeah. Like what movies aren't getting made because people are spending money on Batman again. You know what I mean? Like, you know, all the Marvel movies and all that, they're fantastic, but like, what's not, what that's new what's that possibly is a new character that doesn't exist in the world because we had to make five more batman movies you know what i mean like what's the what's the who's the creator out there that's sitting there with something truly original that doesn't get into the world because uh, all these major conglomerates are were are obsessed with the next iteration of batman or star wars or whatever it is because they know that's a guaranteed hit they know that's a known commodity um it's one of the reasons I've very seldom worked on um, revivals, and My Little Pony being an exception, but I just prefer working on new stuff, even coming from me. I want to see what I'm going to come up with next or what Craig's going to come up with next. It doesn't mean like if Craig said, hey, I'm doing a new Powerpuff movie that I wouldn't be interested in doing it because I love those characters, but I'm more interested in something new from him than something old because it means there's one more new thing in the world to possibly love. I wish I had friends like you, Rob, because like I said, you have such an interesting way of looking at things. And I don't know if it's <laughs> just, and I'm not calling you old. I have to look at your other po your podcast now to see if you butter everybody up like this. Whenever I bring somebody on, man, it's it's a <laughs> it's a love letter to them. It's okay, me. good. You Thank love everybody. Well, I, I, I still feel good about it, but I'm glad I haven't disappointed you. <laughs> no, All right, well, there was supposed to be a two part. Was there a second part of that question you haven't asked yet? Oh, 100%. Um, when you sit back and you look at your career, if you were to sit back and say, hey, man, I'm done. I've put my pen to the paper for the very last time. I want to sit back and I want to relax and I want to spend the rest of my time with my wife, my kids, my family, my friends, you know, what have you, right? When you sit back and you really think about your entire career, you've had your highs, you've had your lows, you've had your hits, you've had your misses, right? Like everybody has in this industry. What is the fondest thought or what is the first thought or emotion that is elicited when you think about your entire career? What comes to mind? Um, I mean, I'm very happy with how things have gone for me. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because I have, Gendy and Craig are both good friends of mine and they've had multiple shows. And part of me thinks like, well, I should have had multiple shows. Mm -hmm. But I think that's more of an ego trip than anything else. I don't know that I would have been happier if I'd 
done another show after Teenage Robot and done another show after that. I know I would have been more stressed. Yeah. I know that I would have like, I mean, I would have a bigger, I would have more things for people to look up on Wikipedia when they, you know, they see my name. But, you know, before I had my own show, like I, I hinted at before, um, you know, I was very jealous of the attention that was showered on Gimme when, when Dexter came out because I felt like, well, that was a collaborative effort. There were really five of us that kind of created that show together with Gendy being the main, the main guy and in, in doing the most amount of work, uh, no doubt. But like, I felt like, well, Gendy didn't create this on his own. And I was very jealous of all that attention. But then when I had my own show and I saw, well, this is what, this is the, this is the price you pay to get that attention for something to be associated with you it's it's a it's it's you know it's difficult it's you better really want to have your own show i know that now it seems like there's so many people that work in the industry it's like well of course i want to get my own show because it's such a uh, because so many people have created original shows back when we started doing it there's only a few people it wasn't it wasn't a job position to aspire to so when that idea when that opportunity came along first to gandhi and then to the the rest of us you grabbed at it but it's 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 not an easy thing to do um so I'm happy with what I've done. I feel like I've, you know, besides creating my own show, I've been, I really enjoy the level of which I'm usually involved in with the creators, either working with them, helping them come up with the show that they're going to create, being creatively involved on a top level. Um, I love doing, I love telling stories. I love coming up and helping create characters and um, the storytelling aspect of it is something that I really love. So I've been very happy um, being being able to be a storyteller. And if somebody asked me, what do you do for a living or why would you describe yourself in one word, it wouldn't be animator or cartoonist or whatever, it would be storyteller. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's just that I pick the visual method of storytelling, which is animation. Um, uh, because I loved it, because I'm a fan of it, and because that's the way I want the way I wanted to work. Mm -hmm. When it really comes down to it, it's really about storytelling for me. I mean, I, I don't know any other way to wrap this up, man. I mean, like I said, you have been so influential just from the stuff you've worked on, the stuff you've created, the stuff that you've put out into the world, the positive. Not very many people would come over here and say the things that you just said about themselves, right? That you felt that, you know, you should have had a little bit more for the collaborative effort because it wasn't just one, even though he did a little bit more here, a little bit more there. And this just goes across the world. There's very few people that would actually come up and be as honest as you were right then and there. So right off the bat, man, Hats off to you for being a real fucking person is what I'm getting at, Rob. Like I said, <laughs> sure. Now, you know, look, look, I what I didn't understand at the time was that like the way promotion works, they're going to promote one person. That's what they do. Yeah. <laughs> they weren't going to say there's a collaborate, there's a collaborative effort going on in the cartoon. They're going to be like, no, this is, they, they, they sell the show by selling the person who created it. And that's been true of every show I've worked on, including my own. When I had my own show, they sold me. They sold me and they sold sold my life story because so much of what we do when we do create a show is we draw on our own life experience. Like we talked about meaning and account. The reason I came up with meaning and account, not to go into extra innings here, but the reason I did a show about a little girl who had a best friend who was a vampire was I was deathly afraid of monsters as a kid. And I thought they were going to attack me in my bedroom. And after I saw Frankenstein or and Frankenstein's monster and realized that that monster just wanted to be loved. Mm -hmm. I, the way I comforted myself at night was I said, if the Frankenstein monster shows up tonight, I'll tell him that I want to be his friend and we'll become friends and I won't become his victim. And that comforted me enough that I could get to sleep at night. So when it came, when I eventually went to Cal Arts, that's why I came up with this idea of a normal human being friends with a monster, because that's how I got to sleep at night when I was a young child. And I'm talking about getting you sleep for several, you know, several, several months here in a row. Like, uh, you know, this wasn't a passing fancy. I was very scared of the monsters when I was a kid for a very long time. That is fantastic. Like I said, we can never do, you know, your entire career, everything you've touched or worked on in just one short hour, man. Oh, we time. will over the series of the next 10 episodes. We will do it. <laughs> hey, man, if, if you're up for it and you have fun, that's all. <laughs> well, I'm happy to come back again, maybe at least one more time. Maybe 10 oh. might be a little excessive. That, 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 well, I don't know, man. It, it's up to you, really. If 10, 9, 11, 12, who cares? Well, you, you move on and you, you, when you, when you want to loop around back to me, you reach out again and maybe we'll do another one of these. That works for me, man. Uh, is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you would like to push some, you know, I, I know you're working on some things we talked about earlier, Kid Cosmic being one of them over at Netflix. So you can't talk too much about it. But is there anything you can say that, you know, might I mean, uh, the one thing I could say, which is picking up on the storyteller thing I mentioned, is I'm going to have, um, 
I'm going to have some books, some original ideas. I've, I've published a few books with Disney Publishing, which were takeoffs on shows that, you know, like DuckTales and Gravity Falls. And I've just finished writing my first original story in novel form. It's going to be a, a middle grade uh, a hook, a book for middle graders, like a horror fantasy, picking up on the whole monster thing again. Um, it's going to be coming out. It's not officially announced yet, um, but it will be soon. Okay. So if people want to follow me, I'm, I'm active on Twitter. I'm at Rob Renzetti. I'm also on Instagram, but I'm 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 a ghost presence on Instagram, but you can find me there as well. Um, I do I do tweet quite a bit. I tweet a lot about um, teenage robot, a little bit about meaning account, some regularly about my new pet rabbit. His name is Zigzag. You'll <laughs> see a photo of him on there from today if you follow me on if you want to follow me on Twitter. But um, I'll be promoting uh, my new project there very soon, as soon as um, as soon as I can officially talk about it. Beautiful, man. He's been Rob. I've been Julian. This has been the What's in My Head podcast. And this has been a blast from the past, man. Thank you so much, Rob, for doing this. I really appreciate everything. Thank you, Julian. Thanks for uh, reaching out to me. I had a great time. No problem, man. I really appreciate it. You have a great night. You too. This podcast was presented by the Epic Sewers Podcast Network, the home of all your pop culture podcast needs. With shows like Epic Tales, Epic Tales from the Sewer, the Spoiler Force Podcast, Creator Con Q&A, Comic Watchers, and the What's in My Head podcast. Follow us on this journey and get down and nerdy as we bring you the best in pop culture.